Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. We are back once more with Dr. Judd Burton, Dr. Aaron Judkins. Our subject has been Gobekli Tepe. And I have one more sort of fundamental question for our discussion uh, as, as our la the last component of what uh, we've had as our sit down here in a number of episodes and series. And this might sound like what you'd begin with, but I think it is better placed here, but why should people care? <laughs> you know, sort of a, another way of putting that is like, what's the payoff? Why should, why should our interest be drawn to this site? And I'm not talking about just people who might you know, be Bible readers and be familiar with Bible stories, but just generally, what, um, what is it about this site that if people knew it, and if they really sort of got into it, if they gave it some time and paid attention to it, are there problems it solves? Are there other questions that it has a better answer to? You know, these sorts of things. So why should, should people be interested in the subject of this site? I can think of a, uh, well, many reasons, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple. Um, you know, the, all the work that Klaus Schmidt and um, the Turkish government and now Lee Clare uh, have done bringing the site to life, uh, you know, just as a, a project of cultural resource, it stands, you know, it stands on its own two feet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting site, you know, even if you don't bring the, the biblical perspective in on it. But that's the second part of the answer is that in looking, in looking at the site of Gobekli Tepe and its location in southeastern Turkey, on the surface, it might not seem that it has much to do with the Bible or the biblical narrative at all, but in fact, um, you know, this is the lo one of the potential locales for um, the, the Garden of Eden. Uh, Shanlurfa has long been, the city of Shanlurfa, which is just down the road from Gobekli Tepe, has long been a candidate for Abraham's Ur, you know, in, in the Hebrew Bible, as you know, it's not called Ur of the Chaldees. It's called Ur costume, and and the Chaldees don't even end up in southern Mesopotamia until the 10th century B.C. So, a southern location for Abraham's Ur doesn't really work. Yeah, uh, there, there, there's a lot of good arguments to be made for a northern location, sure. you know, because of the Haran tradition. The Haran well, tradition, you know. exactly, exactly, and then you have uh, all the the related significance with uh, Noah's Ark, uh, the, the the flood phase and the repeopling of the earth. Um, you know, all of this is taking place in, in eastern Turkey, in, in southeastern Turkey. Uh, and from there, you know, it's a thoroughfare to these other places, the Levant, Mesopotamia, um, Anatolia, Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there are these o overlapping layers of biblical geopolitical significance and, and in the end cultural significance to to the narrative of the Bible in in Gobekli Tepe the location of Gobekli Tepe is within that domain mm -hmm. it's the cradle I think of civilization yeah, yeah. Uh, here it's it's an a reemergence if you will of the people um, I believe that's coming after the flood and, and it fits very well uh, with with the Noahic deluge in what um, um, you know is known as the meltwater pulse one A uh, event, uh, where um, you have uh, you know people that uh, are experiencing a, a colder climate, a drier climate, climate change, if you will, but not in a political sense, but uh, definitely some some changes going on there. That they uh, were, you know, having to uh, survive uh, in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, you know, and then all of a sudden you have this event where uh, there's just an abandonment, uh, it seems, of civilization again. Uh, about a thousand years, um, you know, at, at Jericho we talked about the Natufians earlier, but you know, between pre-pottery Neolithic A. In B periods, there's about a thousand years of abandonment here, mm -hmm. and this is across the region of of southeastern Turkey, where you know this cradle of civilization occurred. 
why was there an abandonment of this of civilization? You go from, you know, uh, a repopulation of the people to, to, to nothing, and then all of a sudden you get another onset of, of culture. Do you um, think it's migration? No, um, I think it's, uh, it's called the Younger Dross event. And, and that event was another uh, change in climate where the temperatures dropped again, probably globally by 30 degrees. And it just forced, you just could not, you know, you could not really survive like you did before. I think, I think it changed the ecology of where people lived uh, in this area. Um, there was perhaps uh, less water. Uh, the, uh, there was just less game, less crops. It's a drier climate, but much colder. And this younger Dross event, I think, forced people back kind of underground, you know, for shelter. You just, it was very hard to live on the surface. It was a strange and, sequence yeah, of events, it was. too. Yeah. Because, there, you know, included within that were, were increased periods of solar activity where you have these really, yeah. really, really powerful mass coronal ejections. Um, so powerful that some of them even reach through our, you know, our protective layers, the Van Allen belts, and vitrified surface rock. That's in the archaeological record. Yeah, I we think know, uh, Dr. Robert Schock talked yeah, a little bit yeah, about he, that. He, well, well, he does, but there, I mean, there are other geologists that, have, yeah. you know, and archaeologists who have talked about that as well. So this is this is basically aligning the chronology of the site with some of these, you know, other other areas of science, you know, that where the dating would sort of fit in. You know, or would align with what's going on on the ground. So these you know, meteorological or atmospheric events or climate events. Right, and I, I think in, that's another good reason why people I think should be interested in the site is because you can anchor that to what's actually happening in the geologic the geological history of the planet, not just the not just the cultural history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something that happened there, you know, before and after at Gobekli Tepe that that there was. People there, probably a thousand to fifteen hundred years of, of use at Gobekli Tepe, and then it was deliberately buried. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was uh, probably what 30, 35 feet of overburden mm -hmm. of just surface dirt that was piled in, and they deliberately placed objects at the base of the anthropomorphic uh, images of those T columns in the enclosures. So it was deliberately buried. It's not. It's not filled in with with the flood or any kind of geological stratification. They hand buried this thing, mm -hmm. and, the, and and we got to we got to ask the question why. Yeah, we still uh, don't know. I and, mean, and, e even the the archaeologists that have worked directly on the site are still puzzled as as to why exactly they backfilled the site. Right. Um, whether it was in, out of reverence, whether it was out of some sort of panic, you know, we just we just don't know. What we do know is that despite the fact that it was backfilled. You've got these outlying sites like Navoli Chori, like uh, there's a phase at Shanlurfa too, where you find similar imagery that you did, and even some architectural uh, features oh, yeah. that that you found at, at Gobekli Tepe. I, I, I'm reminded of Urfa Man, yeah, uh, who is who's positioned in basically the identical same posturing as these anthropomorphic. Is uh, this, this is a burial. The, no, this is a this is a kind of statuary okay. that you find. Yeah. Um, it's uh, a life size statue. Yeah, uh, at Yini Yol, in uh, over in uh, in Chandlerfa. Uh, this was about five foot ten, yeah. I think. Yeah, life size statue, but it, it has a V neck a V neck uh, kind of uh, shape. A pair, there's two of them coming down like a like a V neck T shirt if you will, mm -hmm. and his hands coming across his navel, uh, just like you see at Gobekli Tepe on these big 18-foot T-column uh, structures, the hands are coming around to the navel, just like at Easter Island, at those uh, big stone statues, They're, the hands are coming around mm -hmm. to the navel. I think this is getting back to, uh, to the point of uh, life and death, the concept of life and death. Life comes from the navel, from the, from the woman, uh, from the womb, this is the concept of life. This is um, uh, in the concept of death. Is is that you know they were venerating? I think at some point their dead ancestors. 
perhaps even deifying the ancestors. We, we know that they buried the dead under their houses, not at Gobekli, but at other points of time, um, such as um, uh, over at Shanlurfa and um, in Chattahoolik, they were burying their yes. dead under the houses. They remembered um, them by creating these stone masks and these, uh, these different ways that they, and, and you see these same similar uh, stone structures at Gobekli Tepe. So in a broader context, Gobekli Tepe, even though it's a larger um, part of, of, of what's happening, there are similar sites dotted all throughout this region, yeah. and they're kind of all similar in fashion, uh, with the exception of they're actually living in these outlying places mm -hmm. where they didn't live at Gobekli Tepe. So we're seeing a very common commonality in, in, in uh, the, 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 the use of sacred space uh, and, the, and uh, differentiating the communal space mm -hmm. versus the sacred space for rituals, um, uh, housing where people actually lived, uh, the use of cereal production, uh, uh, society and culture development, and um, in, in the concept of life after death. So, so, I mean, basically, if we put it in the form of a question um, this way, if someone came up to you and said, hey, you know, have you ever wondered what, what life would have been like, you know, kickstarting after the flood? Is it fair to say that a good answer would be, well, look at some of the stuff going on here? You know, sure. Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, not just Gobekli yeah. Tepe, right. but these but other, the, yeah. This whole region. Yeah. And then if, if, you, get, if you get the discussion in, into a regional one, then again, for a lot of people who are Bible readers and they're not familiar with these alternative, and I'm going to use that term, alternative northern locations mm -hmm. for things like Eden and Abraham's Ore, mm -hmm. and even wider than that, the, the whole, you know, this is Turkey, okay, which used to be known as Anatolia. Mm -hmm. Okay, Anatolia, the Hittites, the Hurrians, mm -hmm. and all of those eventual migrations that are going to go down, and those are become, going to become the indigenous residents of Canaan, mm -hmm. the ones that have to be expelled. You sure. know, so, and all of those, when they do get writing, are going to have these textual traditions about the flood and giants. And I mean, all of these things actually sort of just roll into a ball of things that if you are interested in, in biblical primeval history, this site actually really could conceivably be part of the mix. Certainly. You know, but, but since a lot of people aren't familiar with the wider question of the Hittites and the Hurrians and these alternate northern locations, they never give it a second thought, mm -hmm. you know, which is you know, kind of a shame. So I, I would assume your, your book uh, throughout is going to be sort of prodding people you know, to maybe not re remember these alternatives, but at least introduce them you know, to, to some of these you know, alternative sites and locations for, for things that are you know, biblically situated you know, to, to stimulate that interest. Is that right or wrong? I, I yes. think you're going to be doing that. In yeah, the there, uh, for both of us, there, there, for both of our contributions, you know, there was a lot of that. And you know, again, sort of you know, looking at it through the biblical lens, if we're looking at a watcher, you know, Nephilim influence here, um, then just, you know, in, in keeping with, with the demonic and there's, you know, the demonic strategy, they're not omniscient like Yahweh, but they can sort of see far enough down the pike that, okay, this territory is going to be significant probably for, you know, somebody in the bloodline of the Messiah. Abra it just so happens that it was Abraham. Um, they would have known about Eden, and perhaps there was something that they could weaponize there at Eden. And so, yeah, there, I mean, there are a cluster of things that, that don't immediately come to mind necessarily when you're considering a site like Gobekli Tepe. Like, there, you know, how mm -hmm. could there possibly be any, well, any biblical connection? Yeah. I mean, as, as I look at it, <clears throat> let, let's just say, again, you, you've, got, you've got this site, and uh, well, let's just go with sort of the the most general, you know, point of entry here. Mm -hmm. that, okay, you, you, if it can be established that this is what life would have been like, you know, how it would have sort of restarted or kickstarted mm -hmm. after a cataclysmic event. You know, we'll just we'll say the flood. You know, for the, for the sake of the discussion here. Well, I if that is coherent and if that's marriable again to the biblical narrative in that sense. 
then you know you would on the other side, according again to Genesis six, you've got the vestiges of of you know what happens with the the watchers, the sons of God, the Nephilim, the, the whole bit. And and if if you just stop at that point and you think, okay, where am I at geographically? Mm -hmm. Well, look where you are. You're at yeah. Anatolia, the mm -hmm. Hittites, the Hurri. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, you could you could see if. If, if the if the ball was still rolling here, like like we, we do have the vestiges of this in this area at this time, well then it, it, when you have these migrations, again into Canaan, mm -hmm. there you go, you yeah. know, because all of these people groups are going to be traceable to these areas, certainly, you know, these these three broad regions by virtue of these migrations. And some of those are going to be directly linked to giant traditions mm -hmm. in their literature. You know, when they when they develop a, a codified, you know, body of writing, and so that that shouldn't that shouldn't be a shock. You know, if you just talk to someone about the conquest and you start talking about Hurrians and Hittites and Sea Peoples and you know, taking these obscure terms, the Girgashites, you know, they like they, they have they can trace their lineage up over here and there. Mm -hmm. It, it sounds like it's totally random and it, and it has no, no meaning. You know, like, well, who cares? Yeah. But if you attach it to something like this, and again, I, we're a long way from being able to, to, to surely do that, mm -hmm. but, but if it was attachable, then it's sort of kind of like, it's a, whole, it's a fuller picture. Mm -hmm. you know, really. Well, what it does is it, um, it anchors uh, the Genesis narrative in a historical concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that makes it um, that makes it real. I mean, this is real history that occurred right. with real people. Yeah, the writers are real remembering events. or drawing on something that actually exactly. happened. Exactly, <laughs> and, right. and th I think it's important because Genesis now is being relegated to myth. Right. Well, there was never a flood. It was never global. There was no Noah's Ark. You know, there was no uh, worldwide great deluge that covered the entire Earth. And perhaps you know. Um, Maybe the Genesis 6 and the Watchers, what is all that about? You know, mm. that's not true either. That's just all legend. Uh, how can we ever put our faith in John 3.16 if everything in Genesis and yeah, the whole Old Testament is just a myth? It's just a narrative. Um, and, and, you know, Judd and I are, are, are wanting people to consider that Genesis does have a basis in history and in archaeology. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons to believe what you believe. It's not just a faith that's based on, well, I just think so, or I hope so. This is, there's archaeological evidence. Right. Faith shouldn't that, be unreasonable. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and this is all we're, po we're posing. It's just, this is a reasonable explanation of life origins. It's not a religion versus science argument. It's a life origins. That's a challenge. It's a life origins uh, argument, mm -hmm. and this is where uh, I think it, it comes down to: uh, Why are we here? Were we really created, like Genesis says, or we were we just put here through a process of random, you know, evolutionary time over eons of time for no hope, no reason, no purpose? We don't know where we're at, why we're here, where we're going, and uh, this is really, a, I think, uh, a problem in academia, especially in elementary education where we're teaching kids, um, you know, you can define your own truth. It doesn't matter. There's no absolute standard for truth. There's no absolute standard for morals. So it's do as thou will, you know. Um, you, you, can, you can, no one can tell you what your, what your truth is. You define it. That's the central, I think, argument here because the Bible says there is a creator. And if there's a, you know, if there's a creation with a design, there has to be a designer behind that. There has to be a, an intelligence that's transcendent above our time, space, matter, uh, length, height, width, and time. There's got to be a, a, an entity beyond that that's outside of that system, that's transcendent above it, uh, that's created it. And certainly what Dr. Burton said earlier uh, in genetics, there is actually more information coming out that this is designed and you take one component out of the cell that ceases to exist, it's all based in symbiotic relationships, even in nature. You can't have the bees without flowers, you can't have flowers without the, without the sun. You gotta have carbon dioxide, you gotta have oxygen. It's all based in a symbiotic relationship. This all gets back to the point of what Genesis was telling us. It's about a creation and a creator who is trying to redeem him, 
redeem us back to him with the redemptive plan through his son Jesus Christ. That's the whole story here. Yeah, I, I would when I you know when we get into you know topics like this, I think another thing viewers have to realize is that look, you you you've been misled if you think that you need a perfect answer to every question. Mm -hmm. You know, because you get well. Let, let, let's look at this through the lens of the biblical worldview, and, and you, know, you, you start seeing correlations. Then it generates questions that you may not have answers for, and then so then people's reaction are, well, let's dump that because we don't have every answer to every question. Mm -hmm. Well, I got news for you. Whatever you substitute, it, it, it's in the same boat. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we need to again stop looking for for perfect paradigms. The, the whole question is the whole issue is is is. Is what the Bible presents, just you know, broadly speaking here, the flow of events and whatnot, you know, and, and it's it's elements of you know having a, a supernatural reality and not just a material reality. Is, is that a workable paradigm? Okay, we're not claiming that it answers every question. That poof, instantaneously, I don't have any more questions in my head now. You know, nothing does that. But is it is it a workable paradigm? Is it is it a legitimate option? You know, and, and a lot of people are are just not trained to even. You sort of open that door because they they think again that in the, in our case science doesn't mm -hmm. have any of those weaknesses. Well, I, yeah, actually it does. Yeah, you know, every other option does. So why is this one squeezed out? Why is this one swept off the table? Um, and, and it shouldn't be. So I, I I I like stuff like this. You know, for that reason only, just to get get the audience thinking that okay maybe maybe this deserves to be part of what I consider. You know to you know, be, be a possible way to answer certain questions. So, and that's a lot of the hope for our book. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just getting people to, to think about these things, and you know that their faith doesn't have to be un, unreasoned. Although, you know, we dump a lot of scientific data right. on, on them. Um, you know, this this is the first ostensibly of a number of, of books because we have more material. Yeah, you yet, yet right. to, yet to go. That's important. You don't. You, it's not like you got to memorize all this stuff. Yeah. It's not like your your faith has to be totally detached from anything reasonable either. Exactly. So it, yeah, that's not the way it works. So we're we're grateful that you guys could come by and do this series with us, and you know, Lord willing, you'll you'll come up with something else. <laughs> <laughs> and 150 <laughs> sort of years, we can go back right. to Tampa <laughs> fully right. Right. Yeah, right. There you go. 150 <laughs> years. You know, kind of when the we'll the, know then. Yeah, there are other projects in academic studies, the Hebrew Bible, that are just that similar time date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we're, we're grateful that you could do it, so thanks again for being with us. Our pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Rev. And thank you for watching this series and this episode of Fringe Pop 321. Please, again, remember to watch other episodes of the show and also visit our website at fp321.com because what you know may not be so.